I want you to want me. The term big ears is a musical term and it really refers to people who listen to a lot. So rather than saying, I like punk rock or I like rock and roll or I don't like country music, somebody with big ears will put themselves in any experience and listen and really try to get the sense of what's good about this music. I think of a band like The Clash even, who are, who are viewed as a punk rock band primarily, but if you listen to their music, there's influences of all sorts in there, and they obviously had big ears, listened to a lot of different styles, and then incorporated it, and it made their own music much more interesting. People who listen to a lot of different perspectives and expose themselves to a lot of different perspectives and opinions similarly end up with a more rounded way of thinking about the world. Uh, and so I think that, that musical concept also applies in a classroom or, or anywhere else in, in real life. I'd, I'd definitely say both Sue and I are dog people. And I, for us, I think that just means that, you know, we resonate to what she's feeling. And so when she's happy and joyful like she is right now, we feel that. And uh, when we come home at the end of the day, she's excited to see us. And, it's, it's just uh, having a member of the pack that always seems to be positive and never in a bad mood. And for us, I think that's what being a dog person is all about. Wow, this really does feel like galloping gourmet. Hey babe, can you check in the trunk and see if there's a red pepper rolling around? There's a rogue one somewhere and it'll be so much better if I get all that. So what I try to do, despite claiming not to be a foodie much, is to get separate flavors, where this one is more the onions, peppers, mushrooms, kind of the earthy um, kind of taste. The spinach with the balsamic vinegar and, and garlic is a little bit more zingy, and I'll eventually add some uh, sun-dried tomatoes to that as well to kind of bring out that zing. In some ways, veganism is unnatural. So to the extent that species are in competition, which Darwin would obviously uh, assume, to the extent that it's natural for a, a stronger species to dominate a weaker one, um, then giving up that ability would be somewhat unnatural. Um, of course, humans are unnatural in many ways. We, we don't live within confines the environment sets for us. We create our own environment and are able to live and spread um, essentially as a disease as we have, humans often perceive themselves as somehow superior to other species. And I, I find it kind of ironic that the ultimate demonstration of superiority would be to not dominate and to not compete in this short-term way that Darwin's theory usually talks about and instead to look at longer-term implications and how it's beneficial for our species and for, and, and for the planet as a whole to develop a more respectful, if unnatural, interaction with the rest of the world. You went hungry? <laughs> My masterpiece. My dad recently passed away and it was a little bit of a, a surprise. Um, I, I got there in time to be with him and, and to have some really good hours with him. In fact, um, the last words he said were, Hi Steve, at one point when he'd kind of come out of a coma. Uh, but it was, um, it was shocking, it was surprising, and it was um, just... The, the one thing I kind of learned is it, it feels like all the love that all of our family had for Dad has, has sort of been split up amongst each other again. So, so the silver lining of it is that the family as a whole feels very close now. When I was raised, one of the things I really appreciated about Dad's um, emphasis on earning your way was that I very much became, that became embodied in me. I, I really felt like you get nothing for free, but you can get anything you want if you want to try. And it, it does seem more and more now with um, credit cards being used as they are, especially, and, and all sorts of things, that students do just feel like if I want it, I go get it. Um, and I think there's, there's something lost there. When you've earned it first and, and thought about it, then when you get it, you have a good feeling. But if you just go and get it and then have to pay the bills later, you get a very negative feeling, and it just doesn't, um, it doesn't work very well in terms of self-esteem and such. I sometimes tell my students that memory is to some extent like that pile of clothes on, their on the floor, in the sense that 
they might throw a shirt on the floor on Monday and then come Friday, it's as though that shirt is gone. Um, but it's not gone. If they, if they can sift through the pile well enough, it's there. And that's how memory seems to work. New experiences get overlaid on old ones. Old ones can seem to disappear. Um, but we've never heard of anybody filling their brain and not being able to learn anything because they've learned so much. In fact, sometimes it seems like the more people learn, the more they're able to learn new information, a uh, so-called fan effect. And it's, it's a, a little puzzling, but it doesn't seem as though we're really hardware limited in that sense. Uh, it seems like the brain is capable of learning a whole lot. To the extent there's a limitation of memory, it's probably the front door um, getting things into the brain and, and less the house itself. The house can probably grow as big as your front door will allow. So this is Dwayne Paré. Dwayne is my PhD student and also sort of partner in crime or partner in business, I guess, when, with respect to Peer Scholar. So students in our class uh, originally submit an assignment as they would in, in many other cases, but then they log back onto the system. And what we're showing you here is when they do so, they see their uh, assignment up top, and then they see below that six anonymously presented assignments uh, written by their peers. And so what we ask them to do is to read through those, kind of think of which one they feel is better than, than another, so rank order them in their mind, uh, and then translate that into both a rating of the quality of the piece, something positive about the piece, and something that could have been done better. This actually started as something to introduce writing back into the class, and the benefit of this is something that's huge, being able to see how other people perform whatever they're doing while they're writing. Um, the good pieces, the poor quality pieces, knowing where you sort of fit in that spectrum. Um, I think that's definitely beneficial for a student when they're trying to figure out how to improve what they're doing. In a sense, the reason why we felt we needed it was largely class size. That when class sizes become so large, then written assignments become very difficult and, and slow to grade. And so this allowed us to literally give students instant feedback, but also uh, it really represents not just a, a way of doing what we did before, but an actual enhanced way of teaching them by giving them this experience with their peers' work. My class is often one of the first ones that students um, encounter at university, which is a rare opportunity. Uh, but I do want to impress upon them right from the get-go that while university is about learning knowledge uh, and acquiring knowledge, that the, much of the knowledge they learn they may never use, or they may use partially. But what university is also about is learning how to think and how to combine that knowledge and come up with creative ideas and, and to communicate those ideas in clear, effective ways. And, and so I will often tell my students things like, you could be the, the smartest person in the world, but if you cannot communicate your intelligence well, nobody will know, and that will be a waste.